getting kind of old, and if I stand a long time, my back gets kind of tired, so I'm kind of comfortable. You guys comfortable? Everybody good? Well, let's pretend that we've just had done a mission trip down to Mexico, right? And this is our last, um, our last uh, day. And so this is the chat. This is the talk that you would hear down in Mexico. So some of you have heard this chat. So if I get off track partway through, those of you that have heard it, you guys come on up or just yell or something and get me back on track, all right? I'll probably get lost. Um, anyway, discovering the true riches of life is the message that we speak down there. And so the question I have for you would be, what are the true riches of life? Have you ever thought about that question? It's a very deep question, not to be answered lightly. It is really the essence of what life is about. What are the true riches of life? We have a culture in Mexico that tells us what our values should be. We have a culture here that tells us what our values should be. But the question is, is what are the true riches of life? Now, you guys are, are in a series called the Chronicles of the Kings, right? Well, uh, I want to uh, thank you guys because you guys have just done a new website. In fact, have you guys gone to your website? You guys should go to SFC's website, OurSFC.org. Awesome website. In fact, I think uh, Jordan's uh, been uh, kind of overseeing that. Well, on the website, you can click a link to the messages. And we have been listening to all of the messages at SFC now for about six months. And this is awesome because a lot of times down there in Mexico, we don't get very great teaching. And it's really nice to listen to somebody that really has an outline and kind of follows, you know, a track rather than talking about everything under the sun. And at the end of the week or at the end of the time, you're wondering, gee, what did the pastor talk about? So we've been listening. So go to your guys' website, listen to your messages. So we've been able to keep track of what you guys are doing. And you guys are in the Chronicles of the Kings. Well, this message kind of really ties right in with uh, what you guys are at. So we just thought, well, we'll just throw it right in and, and become a part of it. So uh, we're talking about Solomon. And he's a great example of a person who God positioned to be able to discover the true riches of life. In fact, what book of the Bible did he write that talks about that? Ecclesiastes, okay? Solomon wrote three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes is Solomon's quest to uncover, discover the true riches of life. And he basically is positioned by God so that he can, he can uh, exhaust to the fullest each category of what we would secretly long for, and he gets it to the hilt. But after each one of these areas, what does he say? Vanity of vanities, chasing the wind. It was good, but it wasn't one of the true riches. So, he was very wealthy. His income at today's gold standard was $1.2 billion. And that was just his income in gold. He had ships that went out. He had taxes. So, he was very, very wealthy. It was good, he said, but it was like chasing the wind. Uh, he had power. He was the a ruler of the civilized world. And it wasn't a democracy. It was a dictatorship. He had ultimate control of the entire world. He says it was good, but it was chasing the wind. Fame, you want to be popular? He had it all. In fact, it says that in, in, in 1 Kings 11 that, that people sought to just come to get an audience with him. Uh, we had uh, the Queen of Sheba that traveled from the south to, to, to uh, see him, and she said, you know, uh, I was told about your kingdom and all that you have, but it was, it's not even half of what the reality is. Um, he had knowledge. He was a very knowledgeable person. He, um, let me get my notes here. He, um, women, he had 700 of the most gorgeous women on the planet, and he had 300 concubines. Because it was good, but it wasn't one of the true riches. So in every category, he exhausted it, and he had it all, and uh, he said it was good, but it wasn't one of the true riches. And at the end of, Sol uh, of Solomon's life, we have a real tragic scene. In fact, there's two people in the Bible that I would not want to trade places with. You ever thought about this? Who would be your first one? Judas. I wouldn't want to be Judas walk with Christ for three and a half years and then betray him? Who would be the other person? Solomon? Yeah, I would pick Solomon. With all due respect and humility, Solomon. 
Why? Because he was given so much. In fact, God visited him, and Solomon said, you know, or God says, ask what you want. Solomon said, I want wisdom to rule your people. God says, that's, that's great. I'll give it to you more than anyone has ever had, and I'll give you riches and wealth and fame and everything. So he had it all. And then in 1 Kings 11, we have a very, very dark chapter. Solomon turned away from God in his latter years. He turned away from God. But guess what? It says God visited him two times, physically visited him to warn him. Did he listen? No. He did not listen. And then guess what else he did? Because he married foreign wives that were forbidden, um, he built altars on the high places to false gods. He, he did them all around Israel. Solomon sowed the seeds for Israel's destruction. In fact, we were on Mount Carmel, weren't we? We saw some of these places. Uh, uh, um, um, what was the other one right across from Jerusalem? That's my favorite place. Where is it? Car uh, Mount, well, what is it? Now I'm really frustrated. Mount of Olives, gee whiz. Anyway, he built uh, high places here and uh, there. So um, he planted the seeds for Israel's destruction. I would not want to be a Solomon. The big message of Solomon's life in a nutshell is this. It's not what you know. It's what you do. It's not what you know. It's what you do. So, um, the true riches of life. You guys ready? Here we go. See if you can find in this first verse what one, the first of the true riches of life would be. You ready? It says, Then I saw a great white throne. What kind of a throne? Great. This is not a small throne. This is a great white throne. And him who was seated on it, earth and sky or heaven, it's a better translation, fled from his presence. So who do you think is on the throne? God. And he is so powerful that the heavens flee his presence. And there was no place for them. Many believe this is when God destroys the heavens and the earth before he creates the new ones. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the book. So we have books and one book, the book of life, and they're all judged according to what they've done, written in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death in Hades, Hades is the present hell, because God's going to create a new heavens, new earth. He's also going to create a new hell. Uh, so Hades is the present hell. Death in, and uh, the present hell gave up the dead that were in them. And how many people? Each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and the present hell were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then it says in Revelation 20.10 that, that they are tormented day and night forever and ever. So, the first of the true riches of life, I would think, would have to be being right with God. Being right with God. And this is the humble question I have for my non-Christian friends. I say this with all due respect and all humility. If on judgment day, the heavens and earth can't stand his presence, what makes you think you will? There's a lot of games we can play, but one game you don't want to play with is you don't want to play with your soul. You don't want to play with God. So the first of the true riches is being right with God. So, first question, am I saved? Am I saved? To not be saved is to miss why you're here. It's the first essence of the true riches. Am I saved? If I am saved, the next question is, am I living in obedience to God? Our heart's passion daily should be to be right with God. That's, that's really the first priority in life if we're say, is to be right with God. Am I right with God? Am I pleasing to Him? Because if we're not, 
If we're not right with God, we're not right with anything. Now, our question for our life change for this particular uh, first of the true riches is this. Why is it important to be right with God? Why? Well, the first is, he is everything. Can you see the, uh, the, the picture there good? Uh, can you tell me what those are? Those are galaxies. Those are not stars. Yeah, those are, those are galaxies. Those little circles are galaxies. In fact, think about that, because in the next uh, couple slides from here, we'll be thinking about that. So, uh, he is everything. Uh, light travels at 186,000 miles an hour. A second, thank you. 186,000 miles a second. It can circle the globe eight and a half times in one second. It would take an airplane 15 days nonstop traveling 500 miles an hour to do the same thing that light can do in one second. It takes light 1.2 seconds to come from the uh, moon to the earth. It would take an airplane about 20 days to do that. It takes light eight and a half minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. It would take light, or it would take an airplane 29 years to do that. It takes light to travel from the sun to our farthest planet, Pluto. It takes 16 days. It would take an airplane 1,142 years. So to go from one side of our solar system to the other, just our solar system, would take light over a month. And it would take an airplane uh, 2,284 years. Did God stop there? I mean, that, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? I'm impressed. I'm impressed already. Did we stop there? We created a galaxy. Our galaxy boast of over 500 billion stars. Many have their own solar systems. 500 billion stars. It takes light, uh, 180,000 light years to travel from one side of our galaxy to the other. If we could reduce our galaxy to a 50-mile stretch, our solar system would occupy less than the width of a piece of paper in our galaxy. Did God stop there? I'm impressed. Did God stop there? He created a universe. With Hubble, we can, this, in fact, this is a deep shot space, a deep shot photo in the space. With Hubble, I guess how many galaxies we have discovered to date? Anybody know? 126 126 billion galaxies. Now, you guys are all smarter than me, but this is how it it works for me. So you can hold your pen out or pencil at arm's length, and behind that point will fit over a 1,000 galaxies. So just move it all around, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. Over 126 billion. But hey, guess what? We're going to build a new generation Hubble so we can find the end of the universe. And then guess what? God says that he holds the universe within his arms. Is that what he says? Right here. God says he has to humble himself in Psalms to come into the universe. He has to humble himself. It'd be like you crawling into a little doghouse. That's what it is like for God to to enter into the universe. And um, so... To not be right with God is to miss everything, everything. Right now, there are seven bodily systems you have operating, respiratory, nervous, blood. You have all these systems. You thinking about it right now? No, it's just all working really fine. My daughter-in-law is pregnant. She get up every morning thinking, oh, I got to form these bones, and I got to form the brain. All that. She doing that? No, God's doing that. How about all the trees? How about all the grass? How about all, the, all nature? God's, God is everywhere doing it all. So, he is everything, and to not be right with him is to not be right with anything. How could a person live life missing everything? Inconceivable. The next of the true this is our galaxy, the next of the true riches is he is everywhere. He is everywhere. 
Uh, God is 100% everywhere, 100% of the time. This is the way I think. You know, there's a lot of us in this room, a lot of people on the, pl- uh, on the planet, and, you know, God's just running around everywhere trying to help everybody. You know, I got a problem, I got to go help uh, Todd for a bit. You know, and then Ed's got a problem, he's praying for this wonderful church, got to help him. You know, I'm running around, and God's just kind of, you know, going everywhere trying to help everybody. And everybody gets, gets this little uh, portion of God, and when we have a big problem, we pray really hard, and we get everybody else praying, then God hears us. We got to have to create this big noise so God hears us. Really not true. God is, his attention is 100% everywhere, 100% of the time. So each one of us has 100% of God's attention 100% of the time. That's why the psalmist said, if I could count the, the, the thoughts that you have towards me, how many would they be? Like the sand on the seashore and like the stars in the heavens. So you always have 100% of God's attention 100% of the time. He's everywhere. He is also eternal. He has never had a beginning and never will have an end. He has always existed. You know, we throw a lot of numbers out, and it's quite curious and interesting, but you know, if you want to count to 100, you can, count, you can do that in about a minute. You want to count to 1,000? Take you 10 minutes. You want to count to a million? You can do it. Just carve out uh, 20 days out of your calendar. I'm going to go on a vacation this year, and I'm going to, I'm going to count to a million. <laughs> Anybody want to go with me? <laughs> uh, you want to count to a billion? You might be able to do it. You've got to start early because it's going to take you 77 years to count to a billion, and that's full time. You want to count to a trillion? Sorry, you can't do it. 77,000 years to count to a trillion. We throw these numbers around, you know, million, billion, trillion, like they're brothers or cousins. They're light years away, aren't they? So, God is eternal. So, to, to not be right with God is to miss everything. He is everywhere. He is everything. He is eternal. It's, it's all about what God, who He is, and what He's doing. So, the first of the true riches of life is what? To be right with God. The second of the true riches is... I believe, our works, our works and service. So our works is what we do for God, serving God, whatever you do. It can be a myriad amount of things of what you do, whatever God's gifted you to do, but it's serving him. It can be just giving a cup of cold water to a child. It can be being nice. There's just a lot of things you can do. Good example. Um, so our works in serving God. Now, why is our works important? Well, uh, the Bible talks a lot about the fact that God is going to reward us for all that we have done. He is going to reward us. In Isaiah 40:10, it says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense, another word for reward, accompanies him. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, preached on the, on the uh, uh, sermon, uh, sermon on the Mount. Uh, rewards is mentioned over nine times. So when you pray, pray in secret, your Father who sees in secretly will what? Reward you openly. When you fast, do it in secret, your Father who sees in secret, secret will reward you openly. When you give, do it in secret, your Father who sees in secretly will reward you. So rewards is mentioned all throughout the Bible. In fact, Go online sometime and do a little search on uh, rewards. It's just the Bible's saturated with it. In fact, the Bible ends almost, this is right before the end of the Bible. It says, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 13, it says, if what he has built, talking about our, re- our rewards, survives, he will receive his what? Reward. If it is burned up, if it's not done for right motives, uh, he himself will, he will suffer loss, but, but he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So, the Bible is loaded with the reality of rewards. God is going to reward us for our service to him. That is a fact. That is a fact. You are going to be rewarded. Now, what's the difference between a gift and a reward? Okay, rewards are earned. A gift is... You just receive a gift, right? What is salvation? It's a gift. 
It's, not by, it's by grace, not through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We receive salvation as a gift. But now, uh, as you've told me, and I believe you because you're pretty, pretty smart people here, uh, rewards are earned. You know what's amazing? Is that, each, think about this, each one of us gets the privilege of determining the rewards we will have. That's not, God has left that up to us. He's going to give them to us, but you get to choose how many you're going to have. That's your choice. The rewards you're going to have in heaven, that's your choice. How long will our rewards last? They will last forever. Um, I think of a, um, a person, Muhammad Ali. Ring a bell? Could be argued as one of the greatest boxers who ever lived. Uh, and, and a reporter went to interview Muhammad a number of years ago while he was still mentally uh, capable. And uh, interviewed him, went to his warehouse where all of his um, trophies were. And uh, the reporter was walking around looking at stuff, some stuff, and he noticed on the, re on the trophies some white residue. What do you think it was? It was pigeon droppings on his trophies. And then the reporter saw Muhammad kind of looking out the window, kind of in a lost glaze, and he muttered these words, I had the world, and it didn't mean a thing. You know... The shelf life for some of our young teen musicians, how long is it? Two, three years? You know, it doesn't matter how much glory we have, but if it's just a short blip on the, on the screen, I mean, I think of Muhammad Ali right now. He, is, he, he really has no use of his body, does he? His mind, he's basically lost his mind. So what now? It's over. And a few of us might remember him, and the next generation probably won't. So, but that's not how it will be in heaven. The rewards that we get in heaven will last forever. They will be as bright and shining a, a billion years from now as they are the first day you get them. They will always be a part of you. You will always enjoy those. So the life change is, am I serving and developing my abilities? Am I serving Am I doing something? Am I earning rewards and developing my abilities? I got a question for you. You guys are all, I, I, I want to say also, uh, we are really impressed with you guys. Really impressed. As, as having served here for uh, a number of years, boy, you guys are just doing awesome. In fact, uh, you guys have got awesome uh, staff. Great job, Ed. Great job, uh, Craig, uh, Will. I don't see my brother Paul here. Great job, staff. Leaders, great job. In fact, um, I have learned, uh, you guys did a survey, and did you guys know that you guys are in the top 2% of the most healthiest churches in America? Did you guys know that? <laughs> Give yourself a hand. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so... Uh, but I, I'm thinking, so you guys are real smart people, right? And you guys are, so I got a question for you, a little test for you. See how you do. Who can tell me someone who won a gold medal in our last Summer Olympics? Michael, good job, Michael Phelps. Okay, awesome, we got one. Give me another one. Ding, 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 ding. Come on. Now, the other service has got at least two. So you guys, I know you guys can do better. Oh, great. Okay, those are the same answers I've got for every service. Good job. But now, I've got to humbly break the news to you, gang. We didn't do so good. We've kind of flunked this test because, I got, because of this reason. If you had spent your whole life becoming the best in something in the world and no one even cared, how would you feel? I mean, what about the other thousands of people who won gold medals? The only thing we can do is remember the standouts. And probably in four or five years, we won't even remember them. I mean, if I were to ask you, I want to ask you because I don't want to get us embarrassed here, but if I were to ask you somebody to get one Olympics maybe eight years ago, hmm, we might struggle. But that's not how our rewards will be. We will always enjoy them, and they won't be forgotten. The next of our true riches is... I believe, 
our relationships with others, our relationships. It says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. So that's the first of our key relationships, to be right with God and to love him. And then we have the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So in our lives, we have a lot of relationships, don't we? We have our family. We have our church family. We have our friends. We have enemies, probably, a few. We have acquaintances. And we have all the one another's of Scripture. So we have a lot of uh, uh, relationships in our lives. So let's think of it this way. In our lives, each one of us has a circle of relationships. Let's call it a circle of influence. And in that circle of influence, that's where God wants you to be serving. So, the life change is, am I serving in my circle of influence? Now, we've got four great staff here. We've got great leaders, but I'm certain that they would be the first to tell you that, they, that you can reach your circle of influence better than they can. Got any teenagers in here? You know what? You can reach your, your uh, circle better than your youth pastor can. So, are you serving in your circle of influence? The next of the true riches of life, I believe, would be the transformation of our nature. The transformation of our nature. So, what's the first of the true riches? Being right with God. The second... Our works, the third, our relationships, and the last are the transformation of our nature. Uh, Romans 8, 28 and 29. It says, and we know that in how many things? You guys really expect me to believe that? Hmm, I don't know. And in all things, God works for the good. Not that God always causes them, but he can, he's so big he can cause them all to work for the good, to those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. What are his purposes? For those God foreknew, he predestined to be what? Conformed or transformed into the likeness of his son. So God is in the process of transforming us preparing us for heaven, our eternal home. It's a difficult and painful process, my dear friends, and you know it better than I do. God allows trials. God allows suffering. God allows sickness. God allows weaknesses things about you that you wish you could change. It might be your intelligence. It might be your personality. It might be your abilities. It might be your looks. But different weaknesses that we have. God is using all these things to transform us. Now, it's very different than what I would choose. I wouldn't choose it. If you were to ask me, hey there, Todd, what's the purposes for your life? What would you like? I would say, well, let me think about that. Okay, well, the first one would probably be that I'd want to be handsome. How about you guys? Anybody in here not want to be handsome or pretty? I want to be handsome. Maybe you guys are like me. I'd like want to be handsome. Uh, the next one is I'd like to be intelligent. I'd like to be smart. Anybody here want to be dumb? <laughs> um, I would like to have a great personality. Yeah, I'd like to have a great personality. Wouldn't that be great? Um, I'd like to be wealthy. Um, I'd like to have an easy life. I don't want any problems. And I'd like to be happy. In fact, I have to confess to you something. You know what a lot of my prayers uh, are about? Removing problems in my life. God, can you fix this? Can you help me with that? Can you make this easier? So I want an easy, happy life. Now, you guys are probably different than me. You guys want these rock-solid, tough, you know, lies. But I'm, I'm kind of a softy here. Um, so that's what I would choose. Uh, so it's very different than what I would choose. But God says, hmm, I had something different in mind. 
I wanted to transform you into my nature. It says in, uh, in Peter that we've been given these, uh, this divine privilege to be partakers of the divine nature. So God is transforming us to become like him. Uh, the trials that he sends, they teach us character. They transform uh, my life. And like I say, they're not what I would want, but he sends them, and he transforms me. Because I'm thinking that it's all about, you know, easy, happy life. God say, no, it's about preparing you for your eternal home and transforming you. The suffering that God allows will make us grateful and appreciate heaven more. You know, a lot of times, think about this. We get sight through contrast. You know what love is because you've seen hate. You know what joy is because you've seen sorrow. You know what peace is because you've seen... And so as you see all these things, you get sight. In the same way, um, God is allowing us to live on this evil planet with a terrible heart, so to speak. It doesn't do what I want it to do. And we will appreciate heaven far more. Do you think when you're in heaven with your wonderful new body, with your perfect personality, with no weaknesses, eat all you want, don't get overweight, don't have to rest, don't have to worry about getting a good night's sleep, your work that you do will be a joyous, fun thing if you want to do it. If not, um, in perfect perfection, not having any government problems, any of those things, and it's just perfect and you're as happy as you could ever imagine you could be. Do you think you're going to want to leave that and come back here? No way. So you know what God is actually doing? Sometimes life is not that difficult. It's very simple. God is preparing us for our eternal home. He's calling those who want to come, come. And then those who want to come, he's preparing us. So we will appreciate heaven far more because of what we have suffered and what we have endured here. So he is in the process of vaccinating us, inoculating us. We won't be like a third of the angels who fell. And we will be so much more uh, grateful. Also, the weaknesses that we have, sometimes we hate them, don't we? I mean, if I could change some weaknesses I have, I'd be the first to do it. If you ever uh, turn on your computer and you're, you're saturated with all these, you know, upgrades you got to do, and I upgrade Windows, it's downloading, I upgrade YouTube, I'm, or, you know, iTunes, I'm upgrading all this stuff. I can't even use my computer because I'm upgrading all this stuff. Well, sometimes that's what I feel. Wouldn't it be nice I could upgrade myself a little bit? But I kind of got left out of a lot of upgrades. It'd be nice to upgrade myself, upgrade my personality, upgrade my brain, upgrade my body, you know, have a full, tall body. Um, <laughs> No one ever accused me of uh, having a growth spurt. I always say, man, you're the same size you were in first grade. <laughs> so um, so we, it would be nice, and sometimes these weaknesses, we wish that we could change, and these, these things in our lives. But you know something? Our weaknesses really can be our best friends. Remember the Apostle Paul? Uh, who had a weakness, thorn in the flesh. He prayed to God three times. God would, and God says, what did God say to him? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Apostle Paul says, hmm. Therefore, I will boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest rest on me. So guess where you can be the strongest? In your weaknesses. And whatever in life now is our weaknesses, whatever it might be, physical, sickness, personality, whatever it might be, in heaven, those will even also be your greatest strengths. I like this verse right here. It's one of my favorite ones. For our light and momentary afflictions, which for how long? Just a moment. Work in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So God's going to multiply. Now, picture this. Your weaknesses are a negative. In heaven, they're going to be flipped to that more extreme poverty. You handicapped? Got a problem? You're going to appreciate your new body. That's one of the reasons why getting old, you're going to appreciate your new body a lot more, aren't you? 
Yeah. Um, so, God's using all these things. He even uses evil. He even uses evil. Remember Joseph sold into slavery, goes down to Egypt. Brothers, he's, he's revealed to his brothers. What did Joseph say to his brothers? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And God is, he, he's, even uses evil. When God decided to create, he had a choice. Puppets or a free will. What did he choose? What comes with free will? Choice. Evil has always existed. A third of the angels in a perfect state chose evil. Um, so, but God is so big, he can even use evil in the process. And like I say, when we get to heaven, we're not going to want to come back to this. Uh, so, God is in this process of transforming us. I'm going to end with a little uh, short uh, uh, story, true story, uh, to illustrate this point. So the life change is in what area of my life do I need to trust God? Now, a number of years ago, I was at a chalk talk drawing. Ever been to one of those? Okay. In, at a chalk talk drawing, a person draws a picture and, and tells a story, communicates some truth with that story. And at the end, they turn the lights on the drawing and it just whoo, comes alive. In fact, we have at our mission base several chalk talk drawings done by a very special person. And this person is in our audience. Who do you think it might be? Chris Russell, where are you at? Okay, raise your hand, Chris. Okay, he did. And so Chris has done this. You, you still do that? Awesome. Powerful means of communication. Well, I was at one of these chalk talk drawings, and the person talking was talking about this uh, process of God wanting to transform us. And he, built, he, he drew this beautiful picture on the, uh, on the sea, this uh, sunset on the, on the beach. And he said that if you will cooperate with God through the trials, the difficulties, the pain, the sufferings, and you won't bail on God, and you will stay on the easel, so to speak, and let God stay, and you stay there and not jump off the easel, God will transform you into a, a, a beautiful picture. And you will become like a sunset on the beach. And so we were, we were all very motivated, very, very touched. And then guess what he did? He took a big black piece of chalk and he went, pew, 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 pew. Put two big X's right down the middle of the picture. And the audience gasped. We just listened to an hour of this guy talking about how God's going to make us this beautiful thing if we cooperate, and now it just ruins the picture. Out of my, not, in my head, I was thinking, idiot, stupid. <laughs> I mean, I, just, I, 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 could not, I, I could not believe it. What have you done? And so he said these words. He says, you probably think I'm an idiot, don't you? You probably think I'm stupid, don't you? He says, you see these black marks? You know what they are? They represent the tragedies God allows in your life. And you say, God, what have you done to me? What have you done to me? And you know, we're pretty smart people. We do the math. God's a loving God. He messes me up. And I tell God, God, no more. If, if I'm going to trust you and you're going to mess up my life, I'm, I'm out of here. And so many people bail. How many of you know somebody who used to walk with God who no longer walks with God? You can all raise your hand. Probably it's, one, it's this problem right here. They didn't understand something in life. In fact, one of the, the questions non-Christians have, God's such a loving God, why is there evil? God's so loving, why am I suffering? And so sometimes that's what God, if, if, you know, if everything's so great, why are you causing me all this pain? And so when God sends these difficulties, these tragedies, we think, God, you have just messed up the picture. You have messed up my life. And so sometimes we bail. But guess what the artist did with those uh, X's? He made four stunningly beautiful palm trees. Mmm. Now we all say, oh, wow. Now that is really beautiful. Before it was okay, but now it's really beautiful. So... God does not ask us to understand everything. He just asks us for one simple thing, and that's our faith. Just trust. Just trust. That's all he asks. So just trust. So don't bail on God. Don't bail on God. So the key summary, as we said about Solomon, is it's not what you know, 
It's what I do that separates true riches from life. So the, so the true riches are being right with God, my reward, serving Him, our relationships, and the transformation of our character. Those are the true riches of life. And real briefly here, uh, you might wonder how can uh, we help you uh, down in Mexico? Well, we are so grateful for all that you guys have done, and we just invite you to come on down. Just come on down and uh, serve with us. Uh, God needs you. God really needs you in Mexico. And it's absolutely fascinating to see what God does uh, down there and the people's lives down there and also the, uh, the Americans that come down. So also spread the word, if you would. Uh, our website is gomissionstomexico.com. You can go on there and see a lot of videos and uh, stuff like that. Also, if you want to be a friend with us on Facebook, we'd like that. We're a friend with a, with a lot of you, and we'd, we'd like to be friends with more of you. Uh, our name on Facebook is just Go Missions to Mexico. And the last is pray for us. Uh, we've been down there 14 years, and it's quite unique living in a, in a foreign culture for a long period. So pray for us. Uh, sometimes we have some unique challenges.